Now, kids, I've got a question for you. Imagine that you're having a disagreement with somebody about what, what, uh, what is illegal, you know, what constitutes breaking the law. Where do you go if there is a disagreement about what the law says, about the rules for our society? Let's say you're arguing with a policeman. The policeman says, I'm going to arrest you because you did the wrong thing. And you say, no, I haven't done the wrong thing. Well, how do you know who's in the right? Got any answers? The judge? Okay, well, how do you know the judge is going to judge right? <laughs> it's a good answer, but I've got to push a little bit further. I see Tori whispering. What are you saying, Tori? <laughs> okay, he's been appointed by other people. Ah, there's, there you got it. It's the law. The reason, the way that we figure out whether or not the law is being broken in, in a, when a crime's been committed is to go back to what the law actually says. And if you look in, um, if you've ever seen pictures of parliaments, usually uh, there's a table in the middle of the room with a whole bunch of these books on it. And I'm pretty sure all those books are the law of the land. I could be right. I'm seeing some, I could be wrong. So I'm seeing some nods. So that's probably a good sign. Um, it's all the laws of the land on a table in the front. And those books, the law, the written law is the standard. Now, obviously, parliaments change the laws and repeal things and whatnot. But uh, for, uh, as, uh, for us as citizens and operating in the world, if there's ever a disagreement over what is right and what is wrong under the civil law, we have a standard to go back to. There's somewhere to go and there's somewhere to check. And for us as a church, as Christians, we have a standard to go back to, even a higher standard than that of the law of the land, and that is God's Word. And that's why we say, as a church, as Christians, we are Word-based. And so we're going to talk about that a bit more this morning. Now, we're in a five-week series on our, on our church values. Now, I got mixed up. I have to apologize, because I said, we're going to, pre we're going to talk about our church, our church vision, <laughs> and then... I went and promptly started uh, preaching through our church values. So I got my, my, my vocab mixed up. I was talking about vision and values. It doesn't really matter whether we call this as a vision or values. Not important. These things are important for Christians, regardless of what um, like categories we want to put them in. So last week we talked about being Christ-focused as a church, as Christians, and this morning we are talking about being word-based. Ordinarily, we preach through books of the Bible, one passage at a time, but we are just taking a couple of weeks break from doing that to have a look at these big picture values, core values for who we are. A good reminder for us. So, what does word-based mean? What does word-based mean? And I would say one of the easiest ways, one of the easiest things to point to in terms of our church history is to see this as a callback to the Reformation idea of um, sola scriptura. Now, I know you all speak Latin, so you know exactly what that means. Sola scriptura means scripture alone. And so, the Reformation was a period of um, a time in, in history, mostly taking place in Europe in the 1500s. And when we're talking about these things, um, uh, the idea of scriptures, scripture is inter interchangeable with God's word. To say scripture is to say God's word. And so that's what we're talking about this morning. And I'm going to flesh out a little bit more about that in a minute. But the Reformation, coming back to the Reformation, it happened in a context where scripture was not the final standard for what was considered good and right. You know, I was talking about the law before. You can go back to the law and that's the final, the final say. Well, back in the, the Reformation era, prior to the Reformation, people weren't doing that. They weren't going back to God's law, God's words, to see what was good and right. 
Instead, there were a bunch of other things that had crowded out God's Word, and they were taking prime place. They weren't word-based. In, some, in many respects, they were tradition-based, or they were, high, um, or they were yeah, they were tradition-based. There, biblical teaching had been misplaced or twisted throughout the years before the Reformation. It's kind of like when you mispronounce a word often enough that you think you know how, what, it, what it says. I used to think that the word espresso was actually expresso. We were talking about coffee. I thought it was espresso, and I was set. I thought I knew how it was, and I used to correct people, thinking that I was doing them a service to correct them. But I was the one in the wrong, despite how, you know, despite how much I thought I was right. And eventually I learned, of, indeed, that it was pronounced espresso, and coffee lovers everywhere rejoiced. Now, I can help others like me learn how to cr- correctly pronounce espresso. But the thing is, this phenomenon can work in Christianity too. One person misappropriates, misunderstands something, they teach that to somebody else, and then before you know it, it's a widely accepted truth that's never been tested against God's Word. How many times have we seen things kind of go viral online? This crazy thing happened, and then somebody uh, puts their sleuthing hat on and figures out, you know, that it was a fake, or that it was all a marketing ploy, or, or, or something like this. When it comes to our life under God, we need something to test ourselves by so that we know what the reality is. We need something or someone that is reliable, trustworthy, and authoritative to guide us. We need somewhere to go that we can ask the big questions and get solid, unchanging answers. We know, as Christians, that the person to talk about these things to is God. He is our trustworthy reliable and authoritative place to go for these answers. But the problem is I can't just waltz right now into the throne room of God and have a conversation with God face to face. Instead, God in His kindness and sovereignty has prepared and preserved for us an earthly source of all His answers to our greatest questions. And that is the Scriptures. The Word of God is Scripture. To understand what to be word-based means, we we have to comprehend what the Scriptures are. Now, for uh, any Christian in the room today, we don't need to be told what the Scriptures are. We know it's the 66 books of the Bible, of the Old and the New Testaments. But bear with me for a minute. I I just want to talk about the idea of Scripture for a minute. What What are some of the reasons why we value it so highly? Well, it is the Word of God. These, the word scripture means writings, um, but, you know, it's a, kind of a, one of those words that we tend to use when we're talking about uh, religious documents. It's, it's more religious to use the word scripture than writings, but that's what it is. Scripture is writings, but these scriptures that we're referring to, these writings that we're referring to are the word of God. From the beginning, God has spoken. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, you know that, one, that bit. What's the next verse? God said, let there be light. And there was light. Our God is a speaking God. And so from the beginning, he spoke words to bring the world into existence. God said, let there be light. And there was light. He said it. God began the world with a word. And he didn't stop there. The scriptures trace God's interactions with the human race from out there out, from that moment of speaking out down through history, following a pattern of seeing God and seeing God what's, seeing what God says and then how people of God react to it. Throughout biblical history, there has also been a pattern of God speaking His words and having them recorded. Even at His own request, He says to some of the prophets, write this down. Um, the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you in Israel. Write it down, have it recorded. And pass it on to the next generation. You shall therefore lay up the words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. God's words to be recorded and remembered 
and taught to the next generation. He expected his word to be collected and treasured and used as a guide and rule. And scripture is that collection of God's words to his people. They include quotations about things that God expressly said. He speaks from heaven, says this. It includes oracles that he gave through prophets. It includes words from angels that are his messengers who delivered messages from him. It includes poetry that was divinely inspired and records of, records of historical narratives that were divinely inspired. All of this was written and collected by God through the Holy Spirit, and it contains all we need to know about God. It tells us what we need to know about ourselves. It tells us how we can receive eternal life. It tells us how we live and how we thrive. God has prepared and preserved for us an earthly source of his answers for our greatest questions. Now, God has on occasion said things that are not recorded for us, Like, for instance, when Jesus had that conversation with uh, Elijah and, who was the other one? Was it Moses and Elijah on the mountaintop at the Mount of Transfiguration? We didn't, we don't have a record of that conversation. Presumably God is in heaven now uh, saying things that we cannot hear or understand. So it's not as though this is every single word that God ever spoke. But for us here and now, this is the treasury, this is the entrusting of the, 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 the package that God has given us of his word for us to hear and to know. God's word is the scripture. But God's word is also our rule of faith and practice. This is part of what we mean by being word-based. God's word is the rule of faith and practice, the standard, the guide. That means for us who cannot yet see God face to face, the scriptures are the place that we go for all our answers about God and about the, the, the most important things of life, what we should do, how we should live. There's nowhere else to go for authoritative answers. Some people might say, oh, well, we go to the church for authoritative answers or we go to the ancient Christian writings. Surely they can give answers on these matters. Well... Yes, they can, but only insofar as they are coming out of the Scriptures themselves. The Scriptures are the top, the top uh, line. They are the standard. Think about this. Let's say you want to know my birth date. When is your birth date, Samuel? Now, you can ask me, and I can give you an accurate answer, but I'm not the authority on my birth date. As much as it is dear to me and part of my life, and I know it off by heart, it was taught to me from a young age, and I'm not actually the arbiter of my birthday. Actually, I need somebody who was there and who witnessed the birth and who certifies it, somebody who wrote it down in a birth certificate. And so if ever there is any confusion about my birth date, I can go back and look at that. That was the standard. Even though I can rattle off that truth to you, I can go back and check and compare that truth with something. So when I apply for a home loan or something at the bank or get, apply for my passport and they say, please show us your birth certificate, it's not because, um, it, yeah, I can tell them my birth date, but they need to see the certified truth, where, where it's written down, where the standard is. They need to see the birth certificate. And the thing is, with Scripture, it's our authoritative document on what we believe and how we ought to live. We can, promote, we can proclaim this truth, we can be a messenger of this truth, but it is, the church can be a messenger of this truth, ancient Christian writings can be uh, promoters of that truth, but at the end of the day, the standard, where the, the source of that truth is, is God's Word. And this is, um, this is a position that uh, the Reformers found themselves in, going back to the Reformation again, they found themselves in a situation where they wanted to go back and see the birth certificate. They said, it's all well and good for you to keep telling us these things, these traditions, these other things. They said, we need to go back and look at the source. To the sources, they said. Unsurprisingly, Jesus gave us fantastic examples of what it looks like to go back to the source. He would go back to the, go back to the scriptures when Satan was tempting him in the wilderness. It is written he said. He is, it is written. And then he quoted the Old Testament to push back against Satan's temptations. Jesus also challenged the Pharisees with Scripture. 
Jesus often used Scripture to show the Pharisees how their religiosity was, in fact, in opposition to what God's Word actually said. They should have been living by the Scriptures instead of by their religiosity and their traditions. Another example is when Paul was traveling around on his mission trips and he was preaching the gospel and he came to one area in Berea and they were one of the groups that he spoke to, these Jews were commended because they wanted to make sure that the message that they were receiving from Paul lined up with the scriptures. And so it actually says in Acts, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They went back to see that if what was being preached to them lined up with God's word. I hope you feel free to do the same even today. Even today as I teach you these things, we want the true message of the gospel to go out faithfully from what God has said. And so we check that message, that message is preached from this pulpit or any other, aligns up with the word of God. And we don't do it in an arrogant uh, prideful matter or look you know I know better I read this we still need to come and do it in a humble and um and 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 kind way willing to be corrected if we're wrong but God's word is the standard that's where we go back to and so today if I started to teach you that the Christian must only ever wear purple clothes I would expect you to say that's odd that doesn't sound like what I read in the Bible let me go back and check and if you did find it there then tomorrow we should start wearing purple clothes. But obviously that's an example that does not find any basis in truth. (laughs) But scripture alone is is the truth, is the rule, is the guide, it is the standard. It is what is binding on this earth and we must obey it as the words from God, very words from God. It can be trusted where sinful and broken people cannot. And just a reminder here that we don't only obey when we understand you know, parents often we have to help our kids uh, learn this truth, right? We go, can you please do X, Y, Z? Why? 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 <laughs> you might know that I have a three-year-old. Um, but the, the, when, we, when it comes to God, right, we don't just only obey when we understand, when we have the theological understanding about why he said this and what this is about and what this means. We obey first and we ask questions later. That's how we should come to God's Word, willing to listen to what He says, do what He says. But yes, it's still good to ask questions and to search the Scriptures and to and try and understand along the way. Another thing that what, of what we mean when we say we are Word-based, we mean that God's Word is essentially clear and, and intelligible, that it is understandable. The, the Scripture alone is our rule of faith and practice. It must be... It must be And it has to have some kind of clarity in order for us to be able to read it and understand it. It's no good to us if we can't understand it. And sometimes there's a there's a little saying about the the gospel that I like. It's it's that the gospel is shallow enough for a child to swim in and deep enough for the greatest theologian to flounder. Shallow enough for a child to swim in and deep enough for the greatest theologian to flounder. And so we understand that there is an accessibility to God's Word so that it can be understood. It can be understood by even by children. And yet, there is a depth to it that cannot be plumbed in its fullness in our limited human frames. Timothy was taught the Scriptures from his childhood. Paul reminded him, you know, from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. So even though the scripture is certainly understandable and accessible, even to children, it doesn't mean that it's clear on every point. The essentials of faith and godly living are clear, but there's some stuff in there that's still confusing to people to this day, and we're still trying to work it out, and I'm sure it will be many lifetimes hence before uh, we gain a fuller and greater understanding of some of these problem passages but the complexity and the depth of the scriptures cannot hide the fundamental message away from the average person and I like the way that one of the great coming back to the reformation yet again one of the great uh, reformed um, confessions of faith puts this nicely they say in 
all things in Scripture are not alike plain in themselves. So not every, every part is as understandable as another part. Nor alike clear unto all. Yet those things which are necessary to be known, believed and observed for salvation are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of Scripture or another that not only the learned, so the smart, illiterate people, but the unlearned people, in a due sense of the ordinary means, may attain to a sufficient understanding of them. So in the due sense, in the ordinary means of learning to read or hearing, understanding language, ordinary activity of communication, with the due use of these things, one can understand the Scriptures. So in summary, we ask the question, what does word base mean? Well, it means that the Scriptures are a record of God's work, word to us. It is the only authoritative guide on Christian faith and living. And not only that, its essential message is clear. All right. So we've talked about what we do mean by being word-based. Let's take a moment to talk about what we don't mean by being word-based. What does word-based not mean? mean if you're following along writing down the the headings what does word based not mean well it does not mean that scripture reading is necessary for salvation sometimes as uh, christians we uh we because of the way that we love god's word because of the way that we appreciate and value god's word because of the high regard for god's word we we take it very seriously But it can be done in such a way that actually seems like we're making an idol out of God's Word, if it it, it is possible to do that. I think one of the good ways of, of saying it is the way that Jesus said it to the Pharisees. He said, you search the Scriptures thinking that in them you have life, but they testify to me. So, so our high regard, our high value for the Word should lead us to Jesus not to idol, make an idol out of the words themselves. And one of, the, but one of the reasons, one of the things that we do when we have this high regard for God's Word in a literate society that has free access to copies of the Bible, we lay on each other the burden to be reading God's Word all the time in a way that God Himself does not lay that burden on us. I'm going to, I'll, I'll explain this a, a little bit. The Scriptures are precious to us, we, we study them at, in our church, in homes, in discipleship groups. Some of us even quit our jobs and, uh, so that we can study the Bible more. But as much as we love and treasure the Scriptures as the words of God to us, the Scripture reading is not necessary for salvation. It's not salvation itself. As, as, I, as I mentioned before, Jesus said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it is they that bear witness about me yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Jesus is clearly pointing out it's not the Scriptures themselves that save, rather they're pointing to the one who actually does the saving. The Scriptures illuminate Jesus. They give us the words of God. But it is actually Jesus, the God-man, who does the saving, not the book. It's also worth noting that reading the Scriptures is not a precursor to salvation, nor do you need to keep reading the Bible to be saved. If we were to suggest that that was the case, then what we're doing is saying that there is a that that literacy is a barrier to salvation. And it would also mean that you're saying that um, Bible translation is a barrier to salvation. There are some people in some languages who still do not have copies of God's word in their own language. Does that and, and and don't have printed versions of God's word in their own language? So does that mean they can't be saved and be faithful Christians? No, they can be. It, it might be harder. There might be some difficulties associated with that. But what I'm saying is having God's Word in your own language, a copy of God's Word in your own language is not a barrier. Not having a copy of God's Word in your own language is not, is not a barrier to salvation. Faith comes by hearing. And you do need to hear the Word of God, but we hear it. We respond to God's word and then we are saved and grow in faith. But that does not need the written page in a person's hand, them reading it. We treasure God's words in scripture. We share them, but we don't equate them with salvation itself. God's word is a lamp that that lights up the way. 
It's our path to salvation. What is something else that we don't mean by being word-based? We don't mean that God's Word is our only authority. So if the God's Word is where we go to get the final say on stuff, but it doesn't mean that there aren't other, there aren't other authorities in our life. The Scriptures themselves remind us of our obligation to submit to those in authority over us. And the understanding that we obey the Scriptures will inherently mean that we will obey those authorities, that, those godly authorities that God puts in our life. God calls us to submit to government, spiritual leaders, family leaders. And sometimes that will be hard and, and especially countercultural to us Aussies. But unless our spiritual leaders are going out of their purview or calling us to go against Scripture and leave God's Word behind, then we're called to follow them now, we, can, we have recourse when our earthly authorities are going beyond God's Word, when they are going outside their, their area of authority, then we do appeal to God, the higher authority, and say, I'm going to follow God, not man. But what I'm saying is the fact that Scripture is our authority doesn't nullify those other authorities that God has put in our life. We don't use the excuse of God's authority through his word to avoid earthly authorities. We still need to pay our taxes. We still need to honor our mother and father, even though the overarching submission is to God. The third thing that I'm going to say about the fact that what we don't mean, what is not meant by being word-based, it doesn't mean that God's word is a universal textbook on everything. It doesn't mean that the Scripture alone is the guide and word on every little thing. Or to put it another way, God's Word is not a life manual, it's not a science textbook, it's not a recipe book, it's not a diet plan. Many of the Old Testament narratives were given a summary of battles that are fought and strategies that are used in fighting or waging wars. You know, they did this and they tricked these guys, deceiving them to come out of their city so they could rout them, get behind them and burn the city. These kinds of things, they're recorded for us, but that does not therefore mean uh, the guys down, um, you know, training to be officers and, and learning about battle strategy should open up God's Word and say, well, well, this is our guide, our you know, this, is, this is the rule about how you do war. Okay, so God talks about things that aren't necessarily things that we are a standard for us. And talking about diet stuff, you know, sometimes things are recorded about, you know, prophets ate this diet, John the Baptist ate locusts and honey. That's, he's talking about it, but he's not saying, you're, uh, this is your guideline for how to do a diet plan. So, what we believe and how we, be and how we live, God speaks to that. It will affect all of our areas of life, but it doesn't speak to the specific situations about every single little thing. The Scriptures are not a life manual, so please don't treat it like one, but it does speak to how we live our life, and it has uh, clear things to say about how we live under God. It's not a parenting manual, but... Where it does speak to parenting in God's Word, that is authoritative. Authoritative. The Scriptures, though, are fundamentally about Jesus. And being Word-based doesn't mean that it is the, uh, the alone authority on everything, but when it speaks to something, it is authoritative about that. All right, let's, we're coming down to the end of this. And to do that, we're going to talk about Jesus and God's Word. In this topic, we can end up talking about propositional concepts and truths rather than about the life-giving message of the Gospel itself. So I wanted to close by bringing these things together. Well, as we're talking about being Word-based, as we're talking about sola scriptura, that doctrine crystallized in the Reformation, that God's Word is the basis of our faith and practice. The reason that this doctrine ends up being so fundamental is because in the Scriptures, we find the Gospel message about Jesus. And that Gospel message can be handed down from father to son from in oral traditions. It can be handed down in, in liturgical traditions. But the Scriptures are where the message is encased for Christians to access down through history. It's an external, objective, true source 
about this message of our salvation. We can look back and we can see the unchanged scriptures back to the days of the apostles and even further in some cases we have, uh, we, have, you know, uh, we have copies of God's word from before even Jesus was around of the Old Testament. But what we can't do is look back and see that any other source of, of truth on, on spiritual things, we can't look back and see their validity. Instead, what we find is fallible folks who are doing their best along the way to, to represent God. And some of those who are actually going a bit against God and trying to mislead others. In Jeremiah's day, there was the, the false prophets who were misleading people about what God actually says. In Jesus' day, there were Pharisees who had misunderstood and misappropriated parts of Scripture. In the Apostles' day, they had the Judaizers who were misleading people on God's Word. In St. Nicholas's day, it was the Arians. In Luther's day, there was Roman Catholics. And in our day, there are many people doing the same thing. There is the, the misappropriation of Scripture is rife. But it's not just as simple as to point to the bad guys out there and say, they're doing it wrong. It's, it, it, it's everywhere. And although we hope and pray that we're not doing it, we could fail in this area too if we're not diligent to remain faithful and stick with what God has said. We always need to continue reforming our fallible, wayward minds to be true to God by hearing what he says and turning to him. He's the only place that we can go with certainty and confidence. We're not always going to agree on every little point of interpretation, but the essential message of the gospel is abundantly clear. In this scriptures, we, we come to meet our firm foundation, our cornerstone, Jesus Christ. And because of the work of the apostles and the prophets who wrote the scripture by the Holy Spirit, we can find the fullness of our faith illuminated here. Because of God's preservation of his words throughout history, we can know him more fully. We can understand him through these words. And as I said, the scriptures are ultimately all about Jesus. They point us to him to seek him out for our eternal joy, our eternal life. Our... They illuminate for us through the work of the Spirit, our way into union with Christ and thereby into union with God. What is some of that, that way? Paul writes the Ephesians reminding them that Christians are no longer aliens, strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the what? The foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. We need to come back to these foundations and there find our, uh, the truth that we need to be unified with Christ, to, to be built on the cornerstone, that's, that solid foundation. That without God's word, we end up with a salvation that's not entered into by faith alone, through grace alone. We end up with a saviour who doesn't fully rescue and a faith that ends up serving the self or some other institution rather than the living God. We need God's word so that we can find the fullness of the gospel, that sinners can re receive salvation, life and light by entering into faith alone, by God's grace alone, through the work of Christ alone, to God's glory alone. And so we need to be word-based today because of the twisting of the gospel in all kinds of places, even in our own hearts. And even here this morning, we need to be changed from our old ways of sin and death into the image of Christ. We need our beliefs to be conformed to God's truth and our and a way of life to follow God's way for us. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We need to be able to hear that. And I want you to hear that this morning, that Jesus came to save sinners. And you are a sinner, whether you realize it or not. Our first impulse might be saying, no, 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 I'm, I'm a pretty good person. But when we go back to God's word as the standard, it shows us there that we don't line up. We don't line up with God's law, both externally and internally in our hearts. We need a saviour. And God's word tells us that Jesus came to be that saviour. That saviour that we're going to celebrate momentarily in the Lord's Supper. God's word tells us that if you would like to be saved, if you want the salvation that is held out to you in Jesus Christ, then you need to put your faith and trust in him. God's word tells us that if you do put your faith and trust in him, 
then you receive that eternal life. You receive inheritance. You will join Jesus in defeating the grave just as he did when he died and defeated the grave. God's word tells us that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he will give you his righteousness and take away your sin. He will make atonement for you. God's word tells us that Jesus is coming again to judge the living and the dead. And this is why we're word-based, because all these truths are found there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that you've spoken to us down through history. We thank you, Lord, for the confidence that we can have in understanding uh, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is beautiful, what is lovely, uh, how to please you, how to enter into eternal life. We thank you we can have confidence in all these things because you have given us your word, made it clear to us. We thank you, Lord, that you are the speaking God who has spoken to your people throughout history and that you're speaking to us today, even now through these words. We pray, Lord, that as a church that we would be word-based at all times that this would be our foundation. We pray, Lord, that we might never depart from this. We might never move away from what your word clearly says. Lord, we bring these prayers before you in Jesus' name. Amen.